Thank you very much. And thanks for bearing with us for, through those technical difficulties. Uh, yes, I'm going to be talking about the impact of digital storage. So as we grow to expect more and more accessibility in our daily lives uh, and everything we do from how we order groceries to how we hail a taxi, for the most part, technology has proven to be a really efficient way to eliminate the physical limitations to a lot of our common problems. So for example, instead of a daily newspaper delivery, we get a notification on our phone. Instead of a paper receipt in a store, you can often get an email. And instead of boxes of photographs in a basement, um, many of us store our pictures in a cloud somewhere. And at first glance, this seems like the natural way to build a more sustainable world. But the problem is that rather than leveraging our power to create minimal solutions for our problems, we're sort of gorging ourselves on what seems like limitless space, but it's really not. Uh, and the buildup of all this material in our cloud has an impact beyond the carbon that is produced by the servers that store it. It has an impact on us because we lose track of what matters and what we should save and where it's all stored. We just continue to dump things into the cloud. Uh, and reducing our impact isn't something that's going to happen overnight. It's a pattern and a series of decisions that we need to continue to make. Um, minimizing our impact is a way of life. And this talk is going to discuss practical ways to turn sustainability into day-to-day -day decisions and talk about how just one person can make a difference. So I want to begin with this quote on the internet from The Atlantic. The internet is the single biggest thing we're going to build as a species. Uh, this is a quote that sticks with me because I feel like it's easy to think of the internet as something abstract that doesn't have any physical consequences in the real world. But in reality, it does have very physical consequences. And um, we need to start thinking about it like that. It's a physical structure that we built. This slide illustrates uh, the usage of the internet in a single minute. Uh, in a single minute, there are half a million Facebook comments posted, 350,000 tweets, 300 hours of YouTube videos uploaded, and 3 million Google searches. And all of that usage translates into 7,000 grams of carbon emissions in a single minute. So that becomes 420,000 grams in an hour and over 10 million grams in a day, which is equivalent to 11 United States tons of carbon emissions. And those numbers are growing every single day. This slide shows the carbon impact of some actions that we take on a more regular day-to-day -day basis. Uh, an email is about four grams of carbon emissions. A video is about 0.2 grams every second. And an email attachment can be up to 15 grams of carbon emissions. And um, at this point, I want to put in a disclaimer. I'm not advocating in any way that you should switch to printing everything out on paper uh, and stop doing email and instead start hand delivering messages. Uh, that's also not a good solution. The paper industry by itself is responsible for 0.1% of global carbon emissions. And according to the MIT Institute, a piece of paper produces about 20 grams of carbon emissions. So from looking at the previous slide, you'll remember that that's significantly more than what it would take to store that information online. So just keep in mind that I'm not advocating that paper is the way to go. It's just that we need to be aware that digital um, material also has an impact. And I also want to put in a disclaimer that the burden of sustainability falls primarily on the people who create the web and not the people who use it. So as a user, you shouldn't necessarily have to be concerned with the carbon impact of every single email you're sending or every website you're building. Uh, that responsibility falls primarily on the designers. And this has been a theme throughout sustainability UX conferences in the past. In fact, I think there's a pre-recorded talk by Chris Adams today on how to build a planet-friendly web. So I encourage you to look into that as well. So the information communications and technology industry produces 830 million tons, which is equivalent to about 2% of carbon emissions every single year. And that comes primarily from the energy it takes to store all of that information in server racks and data centers. And speaking of data centers, one data center produces enough energy in a day to power 65,000 homes. And there are tens of thousands of data centers that are spread across the world, many of which run full tilt 24 seven, regardless of demand. Uh, last year in the United States alone, data centers used 91 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, producing 97 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. And unfortunately, just six to 12% of that energy draw comes from doing computations. Uh, the rest of it comes from the energy it takes to maintain these buildings at cool temperatures and keep a bunch of backup servers idling at all times. Um, so when you store something in the cloud, you should keep in mind that it's not just taking energy when you decide to go access it. You have to account for the energy it takes to store that so that 
if at any second you decide that you want to go look at photos from your 2003 trip to Cabo, you can immediately access that within a second from the cloud. And this is a problem that technology companies are aware of. Uh, many technology companies have taken pledges to work towards achieving 100% green energy for their data centers, including Apple, Facebook, Google, Salesforce, and Box. And Apple's actually almost already at that target. Um, so this is a problem that's being addressed at many levels by designers, by technology companies. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on how you can address this problem as a user on a more day-to-day -day level. So to put things in perspective, uh, the internet has a carbon impact of 1.5 times the impact of the aviation industry. So if you think about all the energy that it takes to uh, fly planes all over the world and all the flights that are taking place and then take another 50% of that, that's the carbon impact of keeping the internet running. And now I'm gonna talk through the energy it takes to store something locally to your disk versus storing it in a cloud. Um, so when you choose to save your document to your computer, your hard drive gets going and its little mechanical arm goes back and forth across a large magnetic platter where it's demagnetizing and magnetizing the little cells that are representing your information. Um, your hard drive is requiring about two watts to write data. So if you have a 25 kilobyte text file, it takes about 0 0.0002 seconds to write itself. So the total energy expended is about 0.1 microwatt hours. And then if you decide to store something in the cloud by uploading that same text file to Dropbox or Google Drive, for example, um, this time your text document gets split up into a bunch of different data packets that go from your router to your modem and then across the network through servers, routers, and network switchers until it reaches the data center where it's going to live. And then it gets stored in a hard drive on a server rack. And it's a little harder to measure exactly how much energy this journey uses. Um, but the combination of transmitting your data and storing it in a data center, we think probably requires about three to seven kilowatt hours per gigabyte, according to an analysis by the Stanford Institute. So that's about a million times more than the energy that you used to save the same document to your hard drive. Instead of 0.1 microwatt hours, you used 0.1 watt hours of electrical energy. And for your reference, that's about as much energy as it takes to power an LED light bulb for 30 seconds. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you consider how many text files and how many videos and pictures we're constantly storing in the cloud and then accessing, it becomes clear how much energy that's taking up. Uh, so I wanna take this moment to say that one of the best solutions to this issue is to get into the habit of storing things locally instead of in the cloud when you have the chance. And if you're going to store things locally, then you need to back up your computer, which is a good thing for all of us to remember anyway. Uh, this slide illustrates some of the pitfalls that your computer can fall into, uh, water damage, getting broken, if, you get, if it gets lost. And unfortunately, oftentimes it takes having one of these things happen for us to remember to regularly back up our computers. Um, so don't make that mistake and try and get in the habit of regularly backing up your computer. A good way to do that on a Mac is by using Time Machine, and there's a screenshot of what that looks like here. And then on Windows, a good way to do that is by using file history. So I encourage you to look into both of those means. Um, so now we're going to talk about benefits of reducing your digital clutter and some ways that you can organize that better. So the three benefits of reducing your digital clutter, um, in addition to saving carbon emissions, uh, is that it saves you time, it lowers your stress, and it enables you to focus better. So I'm going to start out with saving time. Uh, the Gartner Group estimates that the average professional wastes 30 to 40 percent of their time on document-related non-value-added tasks. So looking for something or trying to figure out where to save something, both in the physical sense and a regular desk, and then also uh, digitally on your computer. According to a survey by the Wall Street Journal, the average United States executive wastes six weeks per year searching for missing information in messy desks and computers. So that comes out to about 4.3 hours a week that you're spending just looking for things or figuring out where to put them. And then maybe you forget where you put it and you decide to re-download it again or you have to recreate that same thing and it just creates a spiral of time wasting. The second benefit of uh, reducing your digital clutter is that it reduces, it enables you to focus better. Uh, in 2011, researchers at Princeton University found that clutter makes it more difficult to focus on a particular task. Specifically, the visual cortex is overwhelmed by task irrelevant objects, which makes it harder for us to allocate our attention and complete tasks efficiently. Um, so essentially, when there's a lot of clutter, your mind is working overtime to process all of the things that are going on. 
And if you've ever seen studies that show that multitasking is actually less efficient than focusing at one thing at a time, that shows you what a problem that is. Um, when you're trying to focus on one thing, your mind is actually sort of working in the background to process all the clutter as well. And clutter also inhibits our creativity because the human mind is more innovative when it's in a clean, open space and it doesn't have to think about other things. The third benefit of reducing your digital clutter is that it reduces your stress levels as well. A 2010 study that was published in the scientific journal Personality and Social Psychology used linguistic analysis software to measure how 60 people talked about their homes. Uh, people who described their living spaces as cluttered or full of unfinished projects were more likely to be both depressed and fatigued than people who describe their homes as restful and restorative. Um, so this gives you an idea of the impact that having a cluttered home or computer can have. And clean homes also improve your quality of sleep. A survey conducted by the National Sleep Foundation found that people who make their beds every morning are 20% more likely to report regularly getting a good night's sleep. And while obviously cleaning out your computer isn't going to have the same direct impact on your sleep as making your bed every morning, um, it's important to get into this habit of leaving a clean, organized life because those are patterns that carry over into every aspect of your life. Uh, in the same way that needless clutter makes it hard for you to focus on one thing, it also makes it hard to relax because your brain can't shut down while it's processing all those st stimuli. So now that we've talked about some of the benefits both personally and also for the earth and reducing digital clutter, I'm gonna go over some practical tips for reducing your personal digital clutter today. So the first thing you can do is to start naming your documents well and consistently. Um, on the left, there are some bad examples for file names and on the, on the right, there are some good ones. Um, all of us have probably done the things on the left if we're in a hurry, but it really doesn't tell you much about what you're looking at and then you expend more mental energy as you're trying to figure out what that means. Um, some good tips for naming things, you wanna try and include the type of the thing you're looking at. So you can see on the right, they all have titles like forms, photos, and contract. That helps jog your memory. Uh, you wanna include a date, which can be the date created or updated or the time frame it's referring to, like summer 2018. It's a good idea to include the name of the people or the group involved. Um, so if it's a company thing, maybe the client, uh, the one on the bottom says Sam contract, so that tells you immediately who the contract is for. And then it's also a good idea if it's relevant to include a version number or a status. Um, so the one at the top says final and the one at the bottom says V2. And all of those things just help your mind get into a consistent pattern for recalling where you put things, which we saw saves you a lot of time in the long run. The second thing you can do to reduce your digital clutter is to create a good uh, non-complicated file system. Um, so on the left, you see a bad example of a file system, and then on the right, we see a positive one. On the left, there's just a lot of folders going on, not all of them are relevant, and there's no consistent system for keeping them together. Um, some good tips are to organize by date, so both the one on the left and the right organize by the year, um, but don't have that be the only way you're organizing. You can see on the left underneath spring, there's a folder called 03 2014. And without anything else associated with that, it's going to be really hard for you to remember what's in there. So just include 03 2014 vacation to Orlando or something else like that to jog your memory. Uh, you want to avoid overdoing subfolders. Um, the one on the left is more complicated. And sometimes people think if they have a more complicated file system, it means they're more organized. But in reality, it just means they forget where things go. Um, the one on the right is been shown to work well for most people. Just divide things into big categories like business and personal. And then another good idea is to include uh, similar hierarchies. So in the level underneath business and personal, the folders are named according to type, like documents and photos. So there's a photos folder in both business and personal. And that way it's easy for you to remember that underneath that first level, you have the type of document. And that'll just help you keep clear on where everything goes. The third thing you can do to start reducing your digital clutter is to get in the habit of putting things away immediately. Um, so even if it's something that you only need temporarily, just get into the habit of naming uh, like a screenshot that you take for your uncle, funny Facebook screenshot for Bill, and then the next time you're cleaning out your computer, you can remember whether or not you can throw that away or where it needs to go, or maybe you forgot to send it to him, so you can go ahead and do that. And the fourth thing that will help you reduce your digital clutter is possibly the hardest on this list, but also most likely the one that will show you the most gains. Um, so you wanna try it and clean out your digital clutter first. So I wanna bring up um, Marie Kondo's third rule. Marie Kondo wrote the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Decluttering. And um, her third rule is to finish discarding first. She says one 
characteristic of people who never seem to finish tidying up is that they attempt to store everything without getting rid of anything. When things are put away, a home will look neat, but if the storage units are filled with unnecessary items, it will be impossible to keep them organized, and this will inevitably lead to a relapse. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense, because if you have a really clean computer and then you take one screenshot on your desktop, you're going to be a lot more likely to put that away than if you just have a lot going on and you can't even find where it is to put it away. Um, so take the time to sort out your stuff and both organize it and then throw things that you don't need away. Uh, it'll probably both be cathartic and then also maybe turn up some things that you didn't realize you still had and remind you of things. And then the final tip is to remember that professional help does exist. Um, so just like you can hire a professional organizer to help you clean out your pantry, you can hire a professional digital organizer if you really feel like you just have too many folders in too many places and you want to get a professional to help you make sure everything is backed up well. Um, then those people do exist and just keep that in mind. It's a worthwhile investment that'll end up saving you time in the future. And then, like I said, when I was talking about throwing old stuff in the trash, once you get it all sorted out, it'll be a lot easier for you to maintain in the future. Uh, so now that I've gone over all these tips, I wanna conclude with a Valentine to the earth uh, in the honor of Valentine's Day yesterday. Roses are red, water planets are blue. Be mindful of your digital storage and you can help save the earth too. Um, so just remember that it's a good idea not only to get into the habit of storing things locally instead of in the cloud, but there are some things you can do to cut down on the little clouds of e-waste that are following you around. And thanks for hanging out, everybody. That's all.